just want to say a few words to introduce the panel members today. Uh, Robin Thompson has been a uh, patient uh, at our clinic for mm, several years, four years. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. And she's uh, been on, um, on, on treatment for, for all this time and has a lot of interesting anecdotes to share and, and I think be informative to, to hear from her. Uh, Brian Landers, who's sitting in the middle there, uh, is a patient of ours who's, who's on immunotherapy and uh, I think he's gonna tell you something about, about his treatment and, and, and what he's experienced and uh, you know all the short waiting times in our clinic too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kevin Thorpe, who's sitting at the end here, uh, is also a patient under, undergoing treatment and I think uh, we'll talk about uh, how his, uh, what his experiences have been. So with that, let's let our panel members talk. And please feel free to ask questions and uh, you know, any, any, uh, any, any uh, perspectives that you might have to share too. So with that, uh, let Robin, if you want to start. Okay. Um, my name is Robin Thompson, and actually January of 2010, I was diagnosed with um, stage four metastatic melanoma. Um, it had metastasized um, to my liver, my pancreas, and I had two spleen nets. And um, I was referred down to UC San Francisco and um, started the workup process. Um, found out that I did carry the um, BRAF mutation, and um, in April 7th of that year, I started um, treatment in a clinical trial, phase one, phase two clinical trial, with both a BRAF and MEK inhibitor. And I've been going ever since. <laughs> and I'm going to have to talk with Brian, though, because apparently he gets in sooner than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been on trial the whole time. Um, I did have to take, I believe it was about a six week break, about two years in um, from the MEC. I was having a lot of symptoms and um, some changes on x-rays in my lungs. Um, but so far, everything has been good. Um, I am, I think, close to two years now with no evidence of disease. <laughs> so Robin, if you want to share some of your thoughts on, on the hassle and the joys and, and uh, <laughs> of, of being on a clinical trial, what is it, what is it like uh, you know, for somebody who's, who hasn't been on, uh, how, how much of uh, time is that being and how much? Uh, um, for me, the biggest hassle is the distance. I live about four hours away, and um, when you're in a trial, um, most symptoms your doctor needs to see you. That's really nice when your doctor is in the same city. Unfortunately, when you're not feeling well and you're driving four hours, um, that's not always a great thing. The flip side of it is it's four years later and I am still here. And that's probably the best part of this. Um, when I was initially diagnosed, I had two teenage daughters, and of course the first thing they did was go to the internet. And even in 2010, statistics were not a great thing for your kids and your family to see, um, or even have to worry about. Um, but I think that the changes that have come just with all of us patients, you know, participating in trials and, you know, the education that's come out there, to me that is the best and the most hopeful part for other patients to be able to see is that at some point, you know, those numbers are definitely going to be improving and, um, and there's, you know, just that hope that's always there. I, I have one more question for you, and that is that, you know, I mean, looking back today, I think it would have, it's an easy decision, you know, I, I think there's a lot of data, and, but, but thinking back to 2010, when there really wasn't a lot of data that this combination was necessarily the right thing to do, and 
In fact, there was some question about whether this is the right problem or whether you should just do BRAF inhibitors by themselves. How did you decide and how does it feel like to be you know, one of the first people, I think, to, to decide to do that? I think for me personally, I wanted, I knew as soon as I was diagnosed that I wanted to do something that was going to make a difference, hopefully in my life, definitely in the lives of future generations. And so when I presented to the clinic and had the opportunity of meeting my doctors and them talking to me about this new trial and using the combination of both drugs, I, if that was the newest and best treatment that we were seeing at that point, that was what I wanted. And um, it was scary knowing that it was a phase one, phase two trial. We didn't have results. We didn't know how well it was going to be. But for me personally, I just knew deep inside that that was, that was where I was going to have the best impact in my life. And whether I didn't survive it, but those results went on and um, improved somebody else's life. That was, that was my decision that I just knew that that's what I wanted. And, and I felt like this was where I needed to be to get that treatment. I looked at lots of different places. I still do, I still research. I look and see what's new and up and coming. And you know, I'm constantly on the internet. And I look at other hospitals and what's going on in different you know, areas of the United States. Um, for me personally, I just felt like this was where I needed to be, and this treatment was what I needed. Yes? Uh, Robin, did you have any surgery before you started? Uh, I did not. I had, my, I had an initial mole removed um, in 2009. Um, from, by all accounts, my mole was really... It was, it, was, it was melanoma. Um, I was a Clark's 2. Um, I was like a T2. I mean, I just, for the amount of spread of disease, it was really unlikely. But again, that kind of plays on the fact that melanoma just kind of has a mind of its own and kind of does whatever it wants to do. Um, and so um, I had um, an oncologist friend that I had worked for and um, years ago and no longer lived in the area and I asked him you know what would you do if I was you know your wife or one of your kids or your sister and he said um, I would do if you can get your insurance to cover a PET scan every six months I would do a PET scan because in all honesty there's there's no evidence of disease anyplace else and I argued with my insurance, and I got a PET scan every six months. And my PET scan in June of 2010 was negative. And my PET scan in January of 2011, um, I had huge abdominal metastases. So um, I did um, have a biopsy, because I needed a biopsy prior to surgery. But I had so much involvement of disease that surgery wasn't an option, and so, and I did get off. We did actually during my course. We did actually once my tumor, because um, I had that really great initial, probably three or four months where my tumor I had you know no evidence of disease left in my um, spleen. I, w I got down to where there was just a small portion of disease left, which probably would have been resectable. And we actually did have that discussion. Um, for me, I made the decision not to do it. And the reason why was once I had no evidence of disease left, I also no longer qualified for clinical trial. And I just felt like I needed to feel like I was doing something. And, it was working, and don't fix it if it ain't broke. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I had another question for Robin, but I'm going to skip over that question. Uh, I, I'll ask you that later. Uh, but Brian, if you want to share your uh, perspective and, and tell us about yourself and what. Sure. 
Um, my name is Brian Landers. I'm 56 years old. And 20 years ago, I had a melanoma removed from my chest and a <coughs> sentinel biopsy came back completely negative. Um, and I remember having discussions with the surgeon and uh, oncologists and, you know, everyone that I suddenly had to see about further therapy, but this was 20 years ago, and at that time, it was like they almost looked at you and just shook their head, pretty much. So I elected not to pursue any other therapies at the time. And for 20 years, I lived a perfectly normal, healthy, very active fifth grade teacher life. Um, until exactly to the day, one year ago. And I began to bleed out massively from my GI system um, and gastrointestinal system. And by the time it was determined that it was not hemorrhoids, and I was in the emergency room, I had lost half my blood. And so I was given two, un two units transfusion and it was kind of critical <laughs> at the point in time. And they were very quickly looking for the source of the bleeding, which they really couldn't find until they did a pill cam. Now, also keep in mind that the whole notion of melanoma had not resurfaced at this time either, um, until uh, I did a pill cam and they saw something in my small intestine. And so 27 inches of my small intestine was removed. And I recovered from surgery. And then I got the pathology back that it was stage four. Um, and then PET CT scan, MRI came back negative in the brain. And then, but I did have tumors in my right lung. I still had small tumors in my small intestine and a tumor in my bladder. And so then, um, I was, my oncologist at the time, who is wonderful, um, who I met with immediate, I mean, it, it was, it was curious, but wonderful because I would have been very happy to begin my care with him, but he was so adamant that there was one person who was better than him that I had to see, which was, uh, Dr. Daoud, which is how I ended up at UCSF. And so I showed up and, um, you know, we just kind of immediately gravitated towards, you know, beginning ipilimumab, which I did. And I got two infusions of that. And tumor growth seemed to have stopped. It was a little hard to tell. Um, but he very quickly wanted to get me on to um, pembrolizumab, uh, the PD-1 drug, that at the time was still in clinical trial. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about the internet and you talk about how you're looking for information and trying to make decisions. It's a horrible place, by the way, to get information, by the way. <laughs> horrible. Um, unless you know what filters to use in terms of getting your information because you just get bombarded with everything and it's like oh god so it seemed like all along that my first oncologist before I came to UCSF had this in mind really that I was a candidate for it for 20 years for somehow my immune system was able to manage the disease on its own until it reached a very critical point, which is in my favor. And so 12 weeks into um, pembrolizumab, uh, my scan showed that all tumors had decreased by over half. Uh, and that's over, that was only 12 weeks into my therapy, which is every three weeks. Um, it's a 30 minute dosage, it's very small. My side effects have been minimal. Uh, I have a certain amount of fatigue, um, some diarrhea, um, but I'm, I'm still active. I'm at the gym, I'm at the golf course. 
Um, I, you know, surrounded by the people and the things that I need. And so Monday is my 24 week into this uh, PD-1. And I, I actually have a new PET CT scans in, in two days. And then another appointment with you to look at the wonderful results. Um, and a curious moment with Dr. Daoud was when I, I got a copy of the radiologist report from 12 weeks and I was still in a little disbelief that things were going this well. Um, and there was some doctor speak on the report I didn't quite understand about the bladder and so we he would, pulled up the pictures of before treatment and then 12 weeks into treatment and it was just, I mean, it. I don't know what to say. I mean, the, these people in this room are basically spending every waking moment of their lives, you know, helping us, pretty much. And the quality and the, the generosity of their work is, you know, hi, here I am. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a complete responder at this point in time. I'm in a very, very small select group of very lucky people at this point in time and I'm very happy to be here and, and share anything about what's going on. So the plan is to stay on this for at least a year, I think, um, and to even continue it for a little bit after, if I get to that point of no evidence, which I think I will. Um, and then, you know, I guess wait for another 20 years for the <laughs> baby that's not sleeping to challenge me again. So. But um, I have been, UCSF is a, <laughs> it's a huge place. I mean, it's just gargan. I had no idea how gargantuan. I mean, you spent your whole, I, for 20 years I'm like with family medicine and doctors and going in for my physical and, you know, everything, oh, it's nice to see you, everything's fine, you know, sore throat, get medicine, whatever. And then suddenly being thrown here, I mean, it was really, it's like, I was just, you know, what happens? Um, but beyond, you know, what you see with your doctors, I mean, from getting my blood work to getting my PET CTs to, you know, having to step on that scale every single time and, <laughs> every person, every step of the way, every moment here is really, you know, almost unbelievable and exceptional at all times. You're really impressed by our parking system, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, of course, kind of. <laughs> If I can get my insurance, if I can figure out how to get my insurance to pay for that part, I'd feel better. So. Any questions for Frank? I'm just going to hold for a minute because I, I have a lot of questions. That's fine. But Kevin, if you want to share your experiences and uh, a little insight. Uh, my name is Kevin Thorpe, 52 years old. and on behalf of the, the panel up here. I heard Dr. Ortiz and Dr. Algazi thank us. I think it's the other way around. Where we will be thanking Dr. Dowd, Dr. Ortiz, and Dr. Algazi for what they've done for us three. You know, I heard it twice from two doctors, I'm going, no, there's no reason to thank us. Thank you for what you do in taking care of us and then our families. Um, it was May of 2014. <coughs> Not a bad idea to have Burger King, but I choked on a piece of hamburger bun from Burger King. And had a coughing fit for 40 to 45 minutes. So I went and saw my doctor, who's an old school doctor. He says, ah, you got double, you got pneumonia. Here's, we'll give you antibiotics, send you on your way. And in his infinite wisdom, he decides to give me an um, EKG. Well, that EKG was all screwed up in the last one I had. And he goes, oh boy, you had an undiagnosed heart attack, we'll send you up to Sequoia Hospital, the 
these four cardiac doctors were up there. So they all wait for me when I get up there. Uh, we take down to the CAT scan room. Heart solid is wrong. They're worried about the mass in my trachea. And that's when the ball started rolling. A um, little bit concerned. The oncologist there said she might want to try and take it out. And I believe they, they looked at it before they Sequoia Hospital tried to take it out and did not. And then they all referred us up to UCSF to a doctor to take it out of my trachea. And so four days in ICU, took it out, no problem, came back positive for melanoma. And then everybody referred me, us to Dr. Dow. So once again, hurry up and wait for Dr. Dow's busy schedule. He's got a patient list a mile long. So we finally got in and we did the, the whole, what can we do? Uh, and it was stage four. Um, I had pockets of melanoma throughout my body. Shoulder, hip, lower lung. Um, not BRAF, Eugene. So that was kind of a bummer. I thought I was going to take pills the rest of my life. And we did the exper experimental clinical PD-1. And uh, Brian uses the technical term, the, the medical jargon. It's PD-1 in your boy that I was on for a couple of rotations. And um, your boy kind of beat me up a little bit. It's a 90-minute infusion. A little fatigued, but I felt good. I tried to do the normal stuff, go out and work and all this. But it beat me up pretty good. Um, PD-1, which is the half hour, it's, it's parking's fun, like doctor said. But it, you're in and out of there within a couple of hours, and I've been blessed with the results. Um, the last scan I had a couple of weeks ago, and the radiologist did not see any signs of melanoma. So it's, it's a positive outlook and just overwhelmed with UCSF, so. You had a lot of fun with biopsies, right? Uh, yes, uh, Michael, Dr. Dad's assistant, you know, enjoyed taking him off some of my, um, it looked like a pimple, you know, and that's where I thought it was, and I let that go a little bit. But Michael sure enjoyed, you know, playing his 1940s, 1950s music while I'm sitting in my in the, the chair and he's taking the biopsies and um, and I think Dr. Albiazzi said Dr. Dow just loves the biopsies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To everybody you can here, sign this waiver. We're sending it out, we're doing research and all this good stuff. So I have no problem with that, you know. Um, there was there was one here that looked like a raised scar, got inflamed. Um, Michael wanted to take that out, but we didn't have time that one day. We'll make another appointment. Well, I had a few infusion that day, and three weeks later, it, it, it shrunk to almost non-visible to the naked eye. And poor Dow, Dr. Dow comes in, he, he said a couple of choice words in, in disbelief, holy, a couple of times. <laughs> and then go get Michael, Michael comes in, he's going, oh my goodness, where did it go? What did you do? I said, I did nothing. I followed what you told me. Um, and whatever therapy drug you're putting in me seems to be working. And so that was just, you know, their faces like kids in a candy store. And that's, that's what I look for. I don't like the long, drawn-out look, and I'll agree with this panel up here. Do not look on the internet because you're going to get so scared. Listen to your doctors and what they've many, many years investigating and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Any questions for? Yes. Hi. Um, my name's Beverly Barad. I'm a melanoma survivor. Thank you for your story. So inspiring. But my question is, do you think your melanoma originated from a sunburn when you were younger? Um, I would safe to assume what Dr. Ortiz said from day one. Irish, English, Scottish, Danish descent. Uh -huh. um, growing up, no indication of using any skin or sunblock. Right. Um, out in the sun, we'd go to the pool and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, you know, and I was outside, I was a truck driver and outside in the sun all day, you know, you get a good base burn, mm -hmm. let that peel a little bit, 
and enjoy the rest of your vacation. And I did that for years. Um, I had one seven years ago that was taken off my shoulder. And it never got into the lymph node system, but it sat dormant for all these years. I had no symptoms until the choking fit on Burger King bread. So I don't know if it's Burger King or just, you know, it's indicated <laughs> to me that, you know, there's something wrong with you. And it, it, it's probably accumulation of everything. So now, um, even at work, the guys make fun of me for sunblocking or lathering up. I don't care. Um, they can make fun of me all I want. You know, I've got a wife and three kids and a mom that would rather have me sunblock be made fun of than, you know, the other result. Thank you. Sunburn, do you attribute? Yes. <clears throat> um, I think I probably fall in kind of the same category. Red hair, fair skin, lots of freckles, and definitely lots of sunscreen. You know, I was a teenager in the early 80s, and it didn't matter. I never got a tan. My girlfriends did. I never learned my lesson. I mean, we put baby oil on and laid by the swimming pool. So I can definitely remember at least three or four sunburns that were blistered, raised blisters, and um, so, I, but I do think it's definitely that combination of everything. I don't have any other family history um, that we know of, so I think it's just that lifestyle and then hereditary as far as blue eyes, fair skin, and red hair. <laughs> <laughs>